Hello. Uh, this is a conversation with Professor James Young from the University of Victoria, uh, British Columbia, Canada. He is a philosopher of art and has been visiting Portugal. Right now, we are talking to him about several aspects of his philosophy, of his career. By the way, I'm Victor Guerreiro from the University of Porto, uh, and my colleague, Nemesio Pui. Yes, uh, I'm Nemesio Pui from the Complutense University of Madrid, and I'm very pleased to be here sharing both this time with Professor Young and with Vitor about well, uh, aesthetics and the philosophy of art. Uh, we are going to do this, conduct this interview into in five uh, thematic blocks. And the first one, the first one we are interested uh, in your, going back to something you said in Dubrovnik, you, 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 were, you were accessing your past life as a philosopher of language. So we are curious about this transition in your life from uh, your work with philosophy of language and anti-realism to your new skin as a philosopher of art. Um, and I'm going to well, give the word to my colleague now. Yes, because, uh, well, James, I have well, uh, two related questions. So uh, the first one, given uh, your previous background in the philosophy of language and metaphysics, uh, how important do you think that is for aestheticians to have well, another speciality in other area of philosophy? And um, which uh, aspect motivated you to come into aesthetics and the philosophy of music? Well, I think it's very important for philosophers to have a, or philosophers of art to have a more general philosophical background. Um, there's several reasons for that. One is that I think that philosophy of art can be a fairly insular discipline. It, there aren't a great many of us in the world, and uh, you don't get perhaps as many points of view as you would within a larger philosophical community. And I think also, that uh, some areas of philosophy, philosophy of language, ethics, metaphysics, variety of them, um, have a rigor, a discipline, a complexity of argument that I think that philosophy of art is still, maybe still aspiring to. So I think that it's good to have um, a broader uh, philosophical background for that reason alone. Now, why is it that I transitioned from someone who primarily did philosophy of art and metaphysics to someone who primarily now does um, uh, or philosophy of language and metaphysics to philosophy of art? Well, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, I was a philosopher of language manque. <laughs> um, um, I but you have very good publications in very important journals. Well, in that, that's, that's true. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't completely monk. <laughs> um, but I started in the late 1980s publishing a couple of papers in philosophy of music and related areas of philosophy of art. Uh, and a little to my surprise, they started being reprinted, or frequently cited. Um, something that didn't very often happen with uh, <laughs> <laughs> things that I was publishing on uh, philosophy of language. I, I think part of the problem for me as a philosopher of language is that I came to the debate on realism and anti-realism just as it was dying out. So it had dominated uh, thinking about uh, philosophy of language uh, in the 1980s and into the 1990s and um, my first book, uh, which was called Global Anti-Realism, came out in 1995, just as people were getting sick and tired right. <laughs> of that debate. Right. Um, and so that book attracted, shall we say, less attention than I had hoped. Um, whereas in contrast, as I just indicated, uh, pieces that I regarded as a kind of sideline um, were attracting attention. Uh, I had a couple of articles very quickly reprinted in anthologies. Uh, and so, to be quite honest, that was flattering and encouraging. And slowly I made that transition. And I guess around um, the mid to early 2000s, I, I thought over, what am I going to do? And I thought, hmm. Uh, I think I'm going to stick to philosophy of art from here on in. Right. 
But, uh, it was not uh, philosophy driving uh, an interest in the, in the arts, but rather the, the other way around. You had a previous interest in the well, arts. I, I, I mean, it wasn't perhaps not surprising that I moved in the direction of philosophy of art, given that I've always been interested in the art. Um, I spent over 30 years as artistic director of the Early Music Society in uh, Victoria. And in that capacity, we presented many of the world's leading performers of, of early music, and, you know, including Jordi Saval and Emma Kirkby and you know, uh, uh, all kinds of, of really prominent artists. And so you know, that, was, that was something that uh, was always operating in the background for me. Well, the question I have for you is uh, complementary to the question my colleague uh, made. It's how important you think it is for philosophers in other areas to have a background in aesthetics. And I'm thinking specifically of what, what you say about philosophers of language in your introduction to the volume you edited, The Semantics of Aesthetic Judgments. Well, yeah, um, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Uh, when I edited that volume, um, I made a conscious decision to bring together a team of philosophers who work in philosophy of language and in philosophy of art. And the philosophers of language had been making these uh, pronouncements about the nature of aesthetic judgments, but they knew nothing about uh, what we're actually doing with aesthetic judgments. They, they didn't even know very basic things that any philosopher would know. So they didn't uh, have a distinction um, between substantive and, um, and, and non-substantive aesthetic judgments. Ridiculous. The distinction between saying something is beautiful and saying something that is elegant or something like that. Exactly. Uh, and they, they thought that all aesthetic judgments are aesthetic verdicts, which they're not. <laughs> uh, and so they had been operating in blissful ignorance of things that philosophers of art had taken as commonplaces. And so, yeah, absolutely. They, they should do the minimum effort and, uh, and, and find out a little bit more about what philosophers of art have been doing before they make these pronouncements. Because uh, there's a real danger of epistemic arrogance there. I well, sometimes absolutely. find myself confronted with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, speaking as a former philosopher of language, I mean, they, they are a bit angry, arrogant. <laughs> okay. Uh, but just... Just to conclude this section, um, the role that your first book on global anti-realism uh, might or not uh, play still in your philosophy of art, because uh, I think your views towards the usefulness or the interest of ontology of music, for instance, have shifted. Yes, for instance, well, uh, particularly thinking about issues about copyright and in your recent book, in which I, I can't remember that you explicitly assumes a realist view about the existence of Well, it might look that way. Um, but, uh, I mean, at a certain point, you just have to adopt an ontology, right? Um, and I don't, I mean, I, I'm actually pretty careful in that book um, when I introduce an ontology of types. I say, here's one way of thinking, here's one way of talking about these things. Uh, exactly, and uh, my own my, my considered opinion is that is is that of Carnap. I mean, I've really been very heavily influenced by Rudolf Carnap in his principle of tolerance. We must tolerate each other's metaphysical positions, um, and but at the same time, sometimes we need to adopt a metaphysical position in order to to make philosophical progress to talk about other issues. Now, could I have adopted another, uh, to use Carnap's terminology, system form? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could have. But uh, I adopted one that's familiar to many philosophers, easy to understand, um, and uh, accessible to a broad audience. So that's why I use that ontology. Do I think that's the absolute right one? No. <laughs> Thank you. Well, our next thematic block concerns, of course, uh, uh, art and knowledge. Uh, 
cognitivism about the arts, which is your, you wrote uh, a I very- I literally wrote the book. <laughs> you, you wrote the book about it. I mean, when, um, and I would like to start this with uh, a question about the book, because I remember you, I think it was in Dubrovnik, you said that you were, you were going to call, you wanted to call the book the epistemology of art, but they, you couldn't. You, you, it yeah, the, turned out to The be editor called. made me change the title. Yeah. <laughs> but I think there's uh, interesting philosophy in the reason why you wanted it to be called the epistemology of art instead of art and knowledge. Uh, and I would like to hear about that. Well, I don't know if there's interesting philosophy in it, but I, I, I just like the, the, the juxtaposition of the word art and the word epistemology. Oh. Uh, we don't often juxtapose those two mm. words. Right? I mean, I, th I, th I thought this, this will make a, it was a very punchy way of saying art can be a source of knowledge. It's a bit like Goodman's, uh, okay, aesthetics is a part of epistemology. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, and, and I'm, I must say, uh, this, is a, this is a bit of hubris perhaps on my mm. part, but that, it was, Goodman's book was at the back of my mind when I, when I wrote that book. I mean, I was modeling it quite consciously on, on Goodman's book. Um, I mean, we have views that intersect in certain ways, but diverge, in, yeah. diverge radically in, in other ways. But I mean, I was, I was trying to write a book that would, would have the same kind of impact. And needless to say, it did not. But that was, that was what I was trying to do. It, it should be more discussed. Uh, but precisely about Goodman, because if you think what, what made me ask this question, art and understanding is the final chapter of, the, of Goodman's book. Uh, according to Nemesis, it's the chapter through which you should see the whole book. Uh, and I was thinking, knowledge, understanding, different epistemic values. Some, in the, in the cognitivism about the arts, uh, there's this discussion, uh, neo-cognitivists are those who replace uh, some other epistemic value uh, in the place of knowledge. Uh, and so I was wondering whether your reasons had more to do with, with that. Uh, um, not really. I mean, I, I, mean I, th I think that I was an early adopter of second wave aesthetic cognitivism, as you will, as if you may have it that way. Um, I mean, I did talk about knowledge, but I'm often really talking about understanding in that book. I mean, I'm, I'm talking uh, not about propositional knowledge. Indeed, I quite explicitly reject a kind of old-fashioned view that, uh, you know, goes back to the 1950s, that uh, what we get from art is propositional knowledge, yeah. and instead adopt the view that what we get from art is ways of seeing the world. Um, perspectives is the word that I use. Um, and that's, I think, uh, a word that is a, more akin to understanding than it is to propositional yeah. knowledge. Because if you, if you take uh, uh, the classic uh, skeptic, source of skepticism against the arts having a cognitive values, the Stolnitz's uh, paper, um, it, it, can, it cannot, the fact that it cannot give you propositional knowledge that can be ascertained through the usual means and it provides no evidence, uh, you, you get no arguments from works of art. Uh, you, uh, work of art doesn't contradict uh, other wor works of art, like a uh, no piece, of, piece of evidence in science would. Uh, but really, no, that's, people are not used to think uh, of uh, you know, art, knowledge, yeah. going, going in. Yeah, well, one of the points that I make in that book is that art and science are very different. That um, art, well, science begins to, to increase our understanding by bringing particulars under generals, general laws. And in the best case scenario, of course, in science, you have a few general laws that explain everything. Mm -hmm. Art works exactly the opposite way. We understand general things by understanding particular things. We, have, we, we start by having um, a perspective on it, an understanding of, um, a few very particular things and we slowly work our way up. And, and so that's why we need a lot of art. <laughs> um, because no artwork in itself can, can provide much understanding. Um, we, we need a, a whole range of artworks that each gives us 
um, its own individual perspective on reality. And as I say, that's just the opposite of science, where we, we, it's top down. We, we understand things by understanding a few general laws. Right, but it seems to me that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that one of your main motivations for uh, well, writing uh, this book and well, emphasizing the cognitive uh, point of artworks is to rescue the value of works of art against uh, well, the influence of formalism. And uh, uh, yeah. uh, but I have a question in this uh, respect, which is that, well, mm, there are people well, in general the, the, who approaches art just for pleasure or just for uh, kind of entertainment or just for having well, a disinterested uh, aesthetic experience. So would you think that these people are missing something of art or that uh, they are not adequate appreciators of art? Yeah, I think they're missing something. Um, I once said to Peter Kivy, very politely and quietly, do you think you're missing something? He almost bit my head off. <laughs> um, he said, you know, no, I'm not missing anything. I'm not, you know, Leonard Bernstein, but I can understand music when I hear it. I, that was not my point. Um, I mean, I, I guess very early on in my career as a philosopher of language, I. I, I read a passage from Suzanne Langer's book, Feeling and Form, where she says, look, uh, the perfumer, the upholsterer, um, the chef, they provide us with pleasure, but they're not culturally important. And if music and if the other arts could do no more than provide us with pleasure, then they would be like the works of the perfumer and the upholsterer. And, and I guess if there's been one theme that's been dominant in my thinking about the arts, it's uh, that we need to believe that art has content in order to explain why it's so important. Now, I'm not denying that it's possible to enjoy art as pure form. I'm not enjoying, I'm not denying that you can, you know, even put music on as background music while you're washing the dishes. But if we really want to explain why art has importance, one way to put this is a way that Kivy himself put it is that if we want to explain why art and a particular music is profound, it's got to have content. It's got to be the source of insight into something, or else it's like a kaleidoscope, a kaleidoscope or a, you know, another child's toy. And I, and I just, I, you know, my my strong, strongest held conviction in 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 my thinking about the arts is that art is important, and that's the only way to explain the importance of art. I always thought it was highly implausible to think, for instance, that the experience of listening to a, a long symphony, like it's, it's just a sound kaleidoscope, that I'm just uh, here receiving beautiful sounds after beautiful sounds. It's, and it's just like it's the equivalent, the sonic equivalent of a kaleidoscope. That always seemed to me implausible. That, that's well, not really what's going on when I'm listening to Beethoven's symphony or something like that. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's how I listen. I don't think that's how a lot of people listen. But... I'm not denying that some people listen that way. So the formalist has, has got to give an account uh, why we find abstract patterns of sound valuable. And they never do. They always fall back very, very quickly. Uh, from Hanslick to Kivy, more recently to Nick Zangwill, they always say, oh, it's ineffable. It, it's, it, musical beauty exists. They're often realists about beauty. It's out there, it's, a, it's objective, it's accessible. Mm. It's not something that exists only because we think that it does. It's this-worldly, not otherworldly. But you can only touch it by, with metaphors. Well, if that, like that, right? Like that. Um, like that. I mean, they'll, 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 they just say, look, I, I can't tell you what it is. I know it when I see it. Mm. Uh, or, and as the case may be, hear it. Um, but I find that profoundly anti-philosophical. 
Philosophers are in the business of effing things, not saying that they're ineffable, right? Right, but once you approach it, the, the theme of, of music with yes. your example, and we are speaking about formalism, I think that, well, there is one right point in formalism that has to be with a kind of autonomy of art. So it seems to me that, well, let's see that the value of art uh, is in uh, its cognitive import, but it seems to me that, well, in particular in the case of music, uh, where you see that uh, uh, the value of music is uh, to, pro to provide insight and knowledge about emotions, it seems to me that, well, we may have um, two works, for instance, of music, which provide uh, a same cognitive input about an emotion and one of the works having more artistic value or more musical value than the other. This is the intuition that they have. Mm, do you have, this is important for you or is problematic in any respect? I think that musical beauty is not autonomous. Not, or at any rate, any rate, seldom autonomous. Uh, because even if we're not going to music for insight, even if we're not going there because uh, we hope to learn something, I think that almost always we feel that we hear in music something human. And if music is heard as related to the human, its beauty is not e autonomous. It's only autonomous if it's beautiful without relationship to anything else. That's what the word autonomous means, right? And I, I, I think that we seldom hear music that way. And so some musical words that, uh, well, or m musical movements, particularly in the 20th century, that, well, uh, prevent it from going into being uh, representing emotions, music representing emotions, or being in uh, representational uh, stuff, they are not, or they have not the same uh, value as other kinds. There's of a perfectly music. good reason why people don't listen to this music, or almost right. no one does. Um, it's people don't hear the human in it, and that's why, you know, there's not much taste for this. This, this sort of music. Uh, one of the things Zengel says is uh, music is inhuman and awesome for it, <laughs> like stars. Well, and, and, and yet I don't see them, I don't see people like uh, Zengel sitting around listening to John Cage and Stock, you know, and Stockhausen, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> any more than anybody else does. Well, I think the, um, so you made the, your question, but we were driven, for, seamlessly from cognitive realism in the arts to the following block, which was supposed to be music and anti-formalist, because not only are you, did you write a major book on the, on the cognitive value of art, you also wrote critique of pure music, a defense, um, unabashed defense of musical formalism, whose discussion we just started. And I add this question. The, sorry? Uh, defensive and Defense, Sorry, I said, did I That's say... That's very important. <laughs> did I say defensive formalism? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, sorry, defensive anti-formalism. Um, my question was, it re actually relates with something you say in the book about art, in the first book. Uh, you make that an interesting claim that uh, when we speak of expressiveness in music, this is just an uns unsatisfactory way of speaking of representation namely of emotions in music. Just, uh... Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not the only person to, to have made this observation. Uh, I just, as, as you know, I recently finished writing a history of a philosophy of music, and there was an 18th century Frenchman named André Morlet uh, who, who observed that when we're talking about representation in music, we use the word expression. And uh, another uh, contemporary of ours, uh, another important contemporary philosopher of music, namely Andrew Kania, has, has made a similar observation. That it just seems to be a weird feature of English and other European languages that when we talk about representation in music, we instead use the word expression. 
Now, I don't know why that should be, but it, that, that just that seems to be a fact about how the, these languages at work. Um, and I think that, you know, many people deny, indeed I would say a vast majority of philosophers deny that music's a representational art, but they, hate, but they hold at the same time that it's an expressive art. I don't, I think in the end there's, there's not much difference between those two claims. That uh, to say that music is heard as human expressiveness, it's just to say that it's a representation of human expressiveness. And in this, um, well, in this issue of expressiveness, which is the role of musical performance? Because, well, the music composed by a composer in the score may have certain features, but it seems that a performer has a great input in this uh, expressiveness of music. Yeah, and I think that that's been insufficiently recognized in the philosophical literature. Um, you know, if, if you've been to a bad performance of a great piece of music, and I guess we all have, <laughs> uh, you recognize that the, the, uh, the composer's thought doesn't come through. Um, there's a reason why we speak of interpretive artists or performing artists. Yeah, I mean, art, the art of music in particular, is an art that needs to be brought to life. And it needs to be brought to life by somebody who understands the work, who can play, who can play expressive music expressively. Right. And without that, the music is, is just moribund. Right. And, but there can be cases in which, well, maybe the composer wants to express an idea, but the performer maybe express the, the idea better than... That, 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 is certainly, that, the, that is certainly possible, or uses the composer's work as a starting place right. to, to say something else. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of, of the piano performances that Glenn Gould makes of Bach. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, he, they're just a kind of starting point. For, for I mean, Bach's compositions are kind of starting point for Gould, and this probably has something to do with your criticisms to uh, historical authenticity or to some dogmatisms about historical authenticity in musical well, performance. <laughs> well, I've already said that I spent over thirty years as the artistic director of an early music society, right. so uh, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, so-called historical historically informed performance or authentic performance. Uh, and I, I certainly believe that Kivy had a bizarre blind spot when it came to such music. Um, I mean, he, he, he certainly saw it as, as dogmatic, as unimaginative recreation of something in the past. But almost all music, particularly of the Baroque period, was designed to be extravagantly performed. Mm -hmm. Lots of uh, scope was given to the performer. And a truly authentic or a truly historically informed performance of Baroque music is going to be a highly personal, imaginative, maybe even outre uh, performance. So, you know, I think that ties in nicely to, to your earlier comment about the, the importance of the performing artist. Right. And maybe we are, with this of historical authenticity, probably we are moving to another block in an yes, interview, uh, which is about the history, about history. Yes, uh, which is the book you very recently published about the history of the philosophy of music. Uh, on that topic, uh, Nemezi would like to ask you a question first, I believe. No, well, uh, but mine was more general, but thinking about uh, in, in this case of uh, music, do you think uh, that there is the, the performer must be well informed about the thought in the time of the musical composition? How can it make him an influence on that? And thinking about for this instance, this case of the Baroque or by contrast with classicism and like. Well, I, I do think that uh an understanding of what people thought about music in any given period is going to assist the performer 
in coming up with convincing performances. I mean, I learned an enormous amount um, about the relationship between music and, and philosophy in writing that book. So we're all familiar with the uh, phenomenon that existed in the Baroque period between, you know, with the, the French style and the Italian style. Right. What I didn't know, <laughs> and which I, and, and maybe lots of people know, know, knew, but I didn't, is that there's a whole philosophy of music that corresponds to the French style, and another philosophy of music that corresponds to the Italian style. The philosophy of music that corresponds to the Italian style, I call empiricism in philosophy of music. It originates uh, in the 16th century in the Florentine Camerata, and it says that music is expressive because it imitates um, tones of voice and, um, the t and, and, the, and the human voice under the influence of emotion. I call this empiricism because this is something that could only be discovered empirically. Uh, the, the people that uh, are associated with this, as I say, are the members of the Florentine Camerata, most notably Vincenzo Galilei. Um, and there's a whole, um, you can trace the, the history of that kind of thought all the way through the Baroque period. Um, this kind of music stresses the importance, not surprisingly, of melody. Mm -hmm. Then there's this other school, also originating in the 16th century, but inheriting an earlier tradition. Um, starts in the modern period with Zarlino, mm -hmm. and it stresses the importance of harmony, not melody. And these, and uh, it's all about um, you know rationally discovered um, uh, melodic intervals and how they contribute. Um, to the power of music. Of course, this culminates uh, in um, both the theory and in the music of Jean-Philippe Rameau. Right. And he's, he, he, he says quite explicitly, oh, you know, melody's not that important. It's all about, it's all about uh, um, harmony. But, so his music in, is in a way being driven by a philosophical theory. Whereas the music of Italians is being driven by another philosophical theory. And that for me was, you know, I said maybe it's something that every musicologist in the world knows, but it was something that was for me a discovery. Um, and, uh, and I think that once you make that discovery, I think that it has an impact on how you're going to perform. Um, you, you understand what you know, people like Rameau were thinking, what people like Vivaldi are thinking um, about the relative importances of uh, melody and harmony, and that's going to have an impact on how you perform. I find this a really, really nice example. And I was asking this because sometimes, he, at least in Spain, I come from Spain, and well, uh, students in the conservatoire, they are much worried about uh, technical aspects that sometimes improving the te technical abilities with the instruments and sometimes disregard uh, some parts of this historical stuff uh, in, in, in light for understanding what they are performing. But now I would like to ask you f for the philosopher's side. So on the one hand we have the analytic tradition which uh, is typically more focused on well, contemporary and thematical uh, philosophical debates. And on the other hand, we have the continental tradition, which typically pay, pays more attention to the history of philosophy and emphasizes the author over the topic sometimes. So it seems that you stand uh, somehow in the middle of them. And well, how do you assess your own position there? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I consider myself an analytic philosopher, but uh, I'm willing to learn from anybody. Uh, and uh, if, you know, I've, I, I was uh, in my book making an effort to um, give a survey of the entire history of philosophy of music. And so I went and I read people like Schopenhauer and Adorno and, um, you know, various other continental philosophers. And, you know, I think in some cases they have 
important insights that need to be incorporated into a, a fully satisfactory philosophy of music. You know, at, at, at the end of the day, I'm an analytic philosopher, that's it. Right, you know? <laughs> right, that is. Maybe, maybe some people hearing this will not uh, grasp the, the difference between being a continental well, philosopher I mean, let me just, and an analytical philosopher. I mean, well, let, I me, mean. let me give you my biased um, account. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted, your bias. Uh, uh, of what it is. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think a continental philosopher is um, frequently most interested in the question, why did this person say what he said? Why did he write what he wrote? What, what are the economic, um, uh, psychological, um, psychoanalytic, social, historical forces that are at work that in, in leading this person to write what he writes, or this mu musician to compose what he mm -hmm. composes. Whereas the, uh, the analytic philosopher is, is more often concerned with the question, when looking at uh, a philosophical question, what is the truth here? What ought we to believe? Not what are the causes of this belief? Uh, and I think that's, that I think is the essential distinction. Okay, that's a nice ending for uh, uh, this walk. So we move. But uh, one but thing you also, want to no, no, be, because I think that well, do not only uh, well uh, draws from uh, the, the the history of philosophy, but you also translated uh, several authors from uh, French aesthetic tradition uh, to to English. So Charles Bateau, uh, Jean Baptiste Dusbeau, and that's and, and maybe. Peter want to ask something about that. I, I, was, Nemezu is kindly reminding me that I have this question for you. Right. Because this was not just about the history of the philosophy of music, but the role of historical uh, issues. And you work as a translator of uh, important uh, uh, slices of the tra French tradition of the 18th century. And I'm, I wanted to hear about uh, the role of translating, uh, translation, philosophical translation itself in your, uh, in your general well I mean look, I could say two things about that one is that and I'm not much of an exception to this rule I mean native English speakers don't frequently speak very many other languages that's right <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean we are shameful by comparison to Europeans I mean continental Europeans and so one of the things that I wanted to do was to bring but to Dubo and the, my latest project is Anne Dacier's book um, on the causes of the corruption of taste uh, to an English speaking audience to a, an essentially monolingual audience uh, but there's a bigger question why did I want to bring these 18th century French uh, thinkers to the attention of this this wider audience well and the answer to that is because I think that they're right about some stuff <laughs> um, that I think that they not so much Dubois of course but I think that they're, they're, they believe that art is important um, because of its content I mean, certainly that's true of, of Bateau and it's really true about this largely unknown figure um, and I think unjustly neglected figure and Dacier, um, uh, who uh, published this book on the cause of the corruption of taste in 1714. Uh, and I mean, she, she very much stresses uh, the uh, importance of poetry. She's primarily con concerned with poetry um, as a source of moral knowledge. And um, Obviously, that's a position that I'm sympathetic to, and uh, I'm, part of what I'm doing is giving my own views a pedigree <laughs> um, and showing, look, there's other people out there that um, have, have held this view. It's not completely outlandish. Um, uh, and I, and I, I think that perhaps uh, we need to ground ourselves in that tradition a little more. Uh, I think that maybe art 
and with it philosophy of art went astray um, in the course of the 20th century. I think in 1917 people should have said to Marcel Duchamp, right. no, that is not a work of art when he displayed <laughs> Fountain. Um, I think people uh, should have said um, when John Cage um, published Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, no, that's not music. That's a nice little joke, John. <laughs> But um, he was not the first one. To, uh, there were 60 years before John Cage. There was a joke in a French newspaper by Alphonse Allais, who was a, a writer, and he published this uh, uh, funeral music for a deaf man, a great deaf man, uh, no notes. <laughs> so it, and it, it was a joke. It was not meant to have the metaphysical seriousness that uh, Cage's piece was. Incidentally, let me let me um, recall what uh, Stravinsky said uh, when. Uh, John Cage came up with four minutes and 33 seconds. Stravinsky said, and I think this was um, the best comment ever on that, he said, I hope we can look forward to longer works from this composer. <laughs> <laughs> That's very easy for the conductor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, I had something else. I had something else about, about, about this. Um, well, because you were a translator, you, yes, you, you I, started yes. in yes, philosophy yes, as a translator, I, I translated, so this is something very familiar with I translated familiar philosophy for many years, and so this was important for me to ask this. Uh, the role of tra translation in your philosophy, if translation played any uh, role in your general philosophical work, if it uh, any, in any way gives you ins a source of insight, a special source of insight. I think that I can say a couple of things about that. One is that Nothing gives you a better understanding of a work than going through it line by line, word by word. Um, you really understand something when you've translated it. And so that's a source of reward. But also I just enjoy the process of translation. It, it's, it's problem solving. Right? How do I somehow convey in contemporary English this thought from frequently rather bad 18th century French. Just because do we have aesthetic choices there in, in this point, maybe, or not, or more pragmatic ones? I, th I think that I do aim to give the text a, a certain grace, mm -hmm. a certain polish, that sometimes the original lacks. Right. <laughs> um, but my primary aim is clarity. Just um, trying to trying to become a kind of conduit for the the, the original author and, and and make it accessible to a, a modern audience. For the record, I got you on tape using Siblian predicates. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't deny Nobody it. Nobody says <laughs> elegant anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, well, I think our last, uh, our last um, block of, of uh, questions concerns the topic of artistic freedom and creativity. One of the problems you raise in this book we discussed in Madrid, um, uh, cultural appropriation in the arts, is but, well, for, for starters, the difficulty to pinpoint what exactly is this thing of culture. Uh, there's, I think there is a tension between, on the one hand, the cognitive value of art and what you say about uh, the cognitive value of art. It's not a tension in your philosophy, it's a tension uh, in what people usually think about this topic, uh, between the cognitive value of art and this idea that human experience somehow is not, uh, not fully intelligible across some contingent barriers like ethnic, religious, sexual, gender, which seems to me this idea that uh, uh, impossibility of human experience being intelligible across these boundaries seems to be the, at the center of some ways of thinking about cultural appropriation that you should not, artists should not transgress this or that uh, limit. So it seems like it, when you think of this, when you, when you see this uh, contrast, you, you would say there's a, an imperative, both political and aesthetic, 
in favor of you know crossing the cultural boundaries, uh, promiscuous interaction, cultural appropriation. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean I think this is part of my legacy as an analytic philosopher. Analytic philosophers tend to emphasize the universal, uh, the, the the human, as opposed to the specifically, uh, you know, individual pieces of culture. Um, but I, I think I want to take issue with with something that you've said here. I, I I agree that in the early years of the debate about cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. you frequently heard uh, complaints about cultural appropriation of the sort that you've just articulated. Mm -hmm. You would frequently hear people say things like, um, "Well, if you're not an indigenous North American, uh, you uh, can't." Uh, accurately uh, represent the experience of what it's like to be an indigenous North American. Um, and you would also hear uh, claims of the form, if you're not a member of a culture, uh, you uh, are unable to use in a effective and uh, artistically successful way the styles um, of that culture. Um, that might be an indigenous culture, but it was a, it was a claim that was frequently made um, about um, African-American music as well. If you're not an African-American, you're not going to be able to uh, sing the blues in a, in a way that will be effective. Um, you don't hear that kind of claim very much anymore. I think just because it's so transparently false um, <laughs> that people stopped thinking that it was a good idea to, to defend that. Um, if anybody thinks that white men can't sing the blues, I've got two words for them. Eric Clapton. Um, so you don't, you don't much hear that kind of claim anymore. The, the cultural appropriation debate has shifted um, towards an, another kind of claim. Um, and the claims that you typically hear these days are of the following form. It's offensive um, for um, white people to sing hip hop. It's offensive for white people to uh, wear um, dreadlocks. Um, that's a different kind of claim. I th and, and who am I to say what's offensive or not offensive, right? I mean, I think this is, I mean, I think we have to take that kind of claim seriously. I mean, I mean there's no doubt that, that, there, that we're dealing with a world in which many cultures, many minority cultures are disadvantaged. They're, they're constantly uh, subject to stresses and uh, disadvantages that, you know, a nice middle class white guy like me doesn't have to deal with. Um, so I think we need to be sensitive to that. It's also the, a particular case of a wider phenomenon because you, you, of, uh, if you're not a woman, you cannot understand the experience of a woman. If you're not a, yeah. a, a black man, if you're not a gay, if you're not, uh, it yeah. seems that this this is an issue of the times that uh, goes you not limited to culture. You, you, um, you, you, you do still hear those claims, but. Once again, they are so transparently false <laughs> that I think you're hearing them less and less, right? I mean, how, how, I mean, how can you make that kind of claim in the face of so many counterexamples of people who have successfully, or, I mean, novelists, uh, filmmakers, and others who, who have successfully represented? I mean, just take, just take the case of Shakespeare, right? He never went to Venice. He never knew any <clears throat> Moors. He didn't know any Jewish merchants. <laughs> um, and yet, seems to have done pretty well. Right. So. I mean, in creating works of universal art. Sure. Like, from what you say, uh, I, you, I could gather the following thought. It's like uh, the aesthetic handicap thesis, what you call the aesthetic handicap thesis, used to be more important at a certain stage, and now, the, the claim is more towards the voice appropriation issue. Like yeah. You cannot do that because you're depriving these people of voice when you do that. I think that's often uh, the claim, but I, th I think it's often more 
inchoate than that. So there was an example about five years ago, um, 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 an American artist named Dana Schultz um, painted um, Emmett Till in his coffin. Emmett Till was the uh, 1956 or something um, teenager who was beaten to death by uh, a white mob. And uh, this uh, painting became a, a, a source of extreme controversy. You know, she's a white woman, how dare she um, represent a um, icon of the, of the black American community. And it wasn't exactly clear what the problem was. Uh, maybe part of the problem was that uh, black painters still lack opportunities. Um, and that's, that's a concern, if that's true. Um, but why should that be an issue of, for Dana Schultz? I mean, she's allowed to express herself. Maybe, there's, maybe in addition to allowing her to express herself, we need to take additional steps to open up opportunities for minority artists. Um, but there was, there was something more going on. It was as if, this is ours. Don't touch it. And, you know, that, that's hard to argue with. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a genuine feeling behind that, right? Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm my, I've already told you, I mean, I'm, I'm with people um, like um, Anthony Appiah when he stresses cosmopolitanism, mm. stresses um, our common humanity. Um, I think, um, what, I mean, let me put it this way. Would you rather white artists not express concern about the fate of, of Emmett Till? Would you rather that they turn their, their uh, you know, avert their gazes um, and say, nothing to see here? Is that really what you would rather have? No, no. I don't think so. Great. And, well, I, I'm an artist and a musician, and I think that, well, what is also at stake in this debate about cultural appropriation is also artistic freedom. And, well, uh, Reading your books, not only these of cultural appropriation of the arts, but also your more recent book from 2020, uh, Radical Rethinking, Copyright in the Arts, I found that you are one of the stronger um, defenders of artistic freedom. And I have a question in, in this respect concerning the phenomenon, uh, the recent phenomenon of uh, the culture of cancellation. So you admit that Indeed, that there are cases in which uh, cultural appropriation is morally wrong. Uh, well, for instance, when it, uh, there is perpe a perpetuation of harmful uh, stereotypes, sacrilege, or insults to another culture. And my question is, would you approve in those cases the cancellation of those works in a museum or in a public space? No. Um, I mean, I, you might want to provide additional signage interpretive text to explain why people find this offensive. But no, I, I, I'm I, very much a John Stuart Mill liberal when it comes to freedom of expression. So, um, you know, Mill says there are three areas of life, of human life that are completely, or ought completely to be unconstrained. Freedom of expression, freedom of taste and freedom of association. And, you know, I think that as uh, soon as you start to infringe on any of those things, you're opening the door to illegitimate restrictions. Um, as Mill observes, you know, human beings have a lamentable tendency to tell each other what to do whenever they have the opportunity. <laughs> and we ought not to indulge that taste. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I'm very much a man of the left, and I, it, it troubles me deeply uh, that this um, council culture um, has been 
able to have so much uh, influence on people who are on the left. All right. Yeah. Especially when you think that an obsession with identity used to be a thing of the right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so the whole situation now is kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I, you know, there are certain theorists <clears throat> on the right who, who, who rightly um, stress the importance of, of liberty. And uh, it, it troubles me deeply that, uh, that some people, at least on the left, ha have, have lost sight of, of the importance. The, the, whole, the whole point of political philosophy is to allow the, is, is to create the conditions for the flourishing of the individual. It's the individual ultimately that, that counts, not the state. The state is the servant of the individual. But to emphasize now your left, uh, right, uh, or side, sorry, uh, well, in your recent book um, of, about uh, copyright, uh, one of the things that you will uh, um, highlight uh, there is uh, that well, current uh, intellectual property regimes um, create inequality, promoting uh, corporations and enterprises. Can you say some, something about that? Yeah, so the reason I wrote that book, as I say in the preface, is I, I just didn't think that I could, as a philosopher, stand by and see the increasingly uh, extreme inequalities in our society. And I, I, I thought about how I could take the skills that I have as a philosopher of art and as a metaphysician um, to reflect on that, that issue. And I came up with this idea that if you could just correctly understand the ontology of artworks, you, you could make some progress in showing how uh, contemporary intellectual property law lacked a philosophical justification. And why was that important? Well, it's important because contemporary intellectual property law, which ostensibly exists to encourage creativity, has in fact primarily the goal of enriching the already fabulously wealthy, the giving money to all to people who already have far, far, far too much. And, and, and protecting the freedom of expression of the artist in such a sense. It seems. And lim well, in fact, that is the, that is the official, the right. that's the official right. justification of copyright law. But, it, but the current copyright re regimes are having just the opposite effect, that they are placing constraints on, uh, on individual liberty. So that, that's, that's a theme, I guess, I guess another theme that runs through my work is the, is the, um, the importance of, of, of liberty. Right. Maybe we are fine. And I think uh, this is a good note to, to end the, uh, the interview. Uh, thank you so much for oh, being my pleasure. Uh, with us for all this. Thank you for uh, inviting time. me to participate. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed your, your, your uh, it's still ongoing, still, yeah. still have one more stop. ahead of you. <laughs> so that is, all, that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you.